Good evening, everyone. <coughs> My name is Dr. Mahesh Naidu, and uh, this is the second lecture in a series of uh, continuing medical education lectures uh, that I will be doing on a regular basis on my YouTube channel. Uh, there was a bit of a delay uh, between the first and second lectures. The first lecture was done in November and uh, we are only getting to the second lecture now in March 2019. Um, I hope to rectify this in the future and do a regular uh, monthly lecture. Uh, once we've uh, finished varicose veins, we'll go on to a couple of other general surgery topics. Um, I'll just give everyone a few minutes to join in. Um, unfortunately, the communication is only one way um, on one tube on YouTube. Sorry. Um, I'm unable to get a response uh, from any of the viewers. However, you can communicate with me through WhatsApp. Um, if you uh, have my WhatsApp number my, on my mobile, 0835568774, it's the same number that I sent the invite out on via WhatsApp. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions during the lecture. Okay. I think we will uh, proceed. Okay, just to recap, the first lecture, which was uh, some months ago, uh, covered the understanding of venous disease of the lower limb. We touched on the concept of phlebology, and um, we realized that it's not something that's new. It's not a new discipline. It's actually been around for some time. It seems to be relatively new in South Africa but uh, it's um, extensively established in the first world. We then looked at the epidemiology of varicose vein disease, uh, touched on anatomy and physiology. Uh, please note that if you happen to miss this lecture, it is available on YouTube. If you are unable to find it on YouTube and you uh, need me to send you the link, please just let me know. You can watch the uh, entire recording of that lecture um, so that uh, you might want to watch that again uh, or before you watch this one. There, uh, we also touched on the different types of abnormal veins, uh, namely spider veins, reticular veins, and then on the obvious varicose veins. We looked at the pathophysiology of um, venous reflux disease. We looked at the etiology. We realized that the timing of treatment uh, is best offered to the patient as early as possible. We looked at the treatment options, uh, going back to the older methods of open surgery um, and um, venous stripping, to the more modern methods, including foam sclerotherapy, radiofrequency ablation, and endovenous laser ablation. We looked at some video clips. Um, there was a very good video clip on microsclerotherapy. And uh, then we also looked uh, just for historical purposes, the Trendelenburg stripping of the great saphenous vein, which I think you'd remember was quite a uh, um, invasive procedure. And then we also considered uh, the complications of venous reflux disease if it is left untreated. So that's just a recap of the first lecture, which as I said is available um, on YouTube and please let me know if you uh, would having any trouble getting that link. Okay, this is uh, my professor of uh, vascular surgery, Professor J.V. Robs, uh, who was also the head of department of general surgery um, at medical school in Durban, UKZN, for many years. Um, he subsequently retired um, as the head of department, but he still operates in private practice in the Durban area. And he said a number of things. One of them was that he would never strip another leg vein again. Um, these little bits of text in red, please pay attention to them. They're very relevant and they will be beneficial to you. Um, varicose veins may have an association um, with a genetic predisposition and the specific gene is the FOXC2 or FOXC2 gene. 
Secondly, the prevalence of varicose veins is roughly equal in men and women. Varicose veins is more common in the left leg than in the right. Um, this is just an observation. No one has really been able to come up with an explanation for this. The handheld Doppler device uh, is useful to assess the saphenofemoral junction, but not the saphenopopliteal junction. So if you use it in the groin region, it can be very useful. But unfortunately, in the uh, back of the knee, it's not. Uh, if you, some are wondering what I'm talking about, this is a handheld uh, Doppler device. It fits in your hand. It's battery operated um, and the little blue tip is a sensitive Doppler probe which you uh, apply uh, ultrasound gel or even KY jelly works just as well uh, to get a good uh, acoustic um, contact medium and you place that over a vein um, for example if you were to place it over the saphenofemoral junction you could then squeeze the calf or the thigh and you could actually listen uh, for reflux, for forward flow and then reflux flow. So it is uh, useful in the saphenofemoral junction. Um, venous claudication uh, is a rare uh, sign or symptom. Uh, it may rarely occur with DVT, but it is almost never occurs with varicose veins. Okay, just uh, please take note of the text in red. Okay, now just a slide on the complexity of venous uh, hemodynamics. If we look at arterial hemodynamics, it's a relatively um, straightforward issue of obstruction. Um, arteries contain low volumes of blood. They are, however, under high pressure and the flow is pulsatile. And the main thing that uh, we are concerned with with regard to arterial um, pathophysiology is patency of the artery. Veins, however, are a little bit more complicated. They tend to be uh, contain high volumes of blood. They are low pressure systems and the blood flow tends to be phasic as opposed to pulsatile. Now, the hemodynamics consists of two things, patency so we are looking for venous obstruction and then competence, uh, competence of the valves and <coughs> uh, weakness of the vein wall. So these two things um, can occur in conjunction, they can occur independently and they cause uh, a lot of uh, symptoms and signs in relation to varicose vein disease. Um, this is a slide um, with a background of a um, histological sample of a vein, abnormal vein. And the reason for this is just to emphasize the vicious circle of um, pathophysiology. So wherever we may pick this up, um, if the patient is noted to have venous hypertension, that leads to changes in the vein wall and these are affected by stresses to the vein wall for example hypoxia, mechanical stress and low shear stress. But this then leads to vein wall weakening and relaxation. This leads to valvular defect. The valves now become incompetent and they fail to uh, do their function and then you'd get venous reflux. Venous reflux leads to v blood stasis, which in turn comes back to venous hypertension. And the predisposing factors are genetics, age, sex, pregnancy, possibly obesity, and poor mobility as well. Okay, with that uh, introduction, um, we will now move on to the bread and butter of this lecture, which consists of... Uh, covers the workup of a patient with varicose vein disease. Uh, this is just a slide to relieve the stress and tiredness of a long day. I know everyone has very had, very likely had a very long day and uh, the heat um, in Richards Bay is incredible. I think it was 30 degrees today. Um, <coughs> once again, the red text, indications for the ablation of varicose veins include 
lipodermatosclerosis. Um, those of you that watched the previous lecture will remember the slide showing the inverted wine glass deformity of the lower leg, um, where the skin is thickened, darkened, uh, it narrows down around the ankle, and this is the typical area that ulceration forms. Ulceration um, is also an indication for surgery, and if the patient has severe pain, which limits their normal function. Now, uh, varicose vein disease is associated with pain, uh, but it has to be severe pain. We do not typically operate just for pain. Now, the patient must have significant symptoms, and we don't um, operate based on the extent of the reflux or the duration of the reflux, which is determined on the venous Doppler, for example. It is the symptomatology uh, which um, would suggest that surgery or uh, radiofrequency ablation is indicated. Okay, firstly, we start with the clinical assessment. Um, we should always take a good general history from the patient, asking about other symptoms, uh, excluding uh, things like cardiac failure um, and um, other comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, uh, HIV, smoking, all of these are related to venous disease and can exacerbate venous disease. Then there are specific questions which you would need to ask. Um, gynae history in a female patient, is there any history of a pelvic mass, pelvic masses as you know, can compress the iliac veins, uh, cause obstruction, and this can lead to uh, venous symptoms and signs in the leg. Um, what about lower abdominal veins? This picture, uh, clinical picture, actually shows dilated abdominal veins. This is the panty line here, and this is the belly button. So this is the suprapubic area, which has prominent varicosities under the skin. And this is usually suggestive of um, iliac vein or a common femoral uh, vein obstruction, which results in backflow, reverse flow, and uh, dilated varicosities in the anterior abdominal wall. Of course, the incidence of DVT we must be checked. Um, a deep vein thrombosis, past history of deep vein thrombosis with persistent obstruction is a contraindication uh, to any varicose vein procedure because the patient, if they have a post-phlebitic limb or if they have um, ongoing obstruction of the deep system, they rely very heavily on the superficial system to carry the blood back to the heart. So it would obviously be a huge mistake to now go and ablate the superficial system. Ask patients about the use of blood thinners. Uh, they may be on warfarin, uh, they may be on clexane. Ask about these things because this could be related to DVT. Um, exclude claudication, rest pain, and arterial insufficiency on history. If these are indeed present, um, this would take priority. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> sorry, there's just a complaint about the sound. I'm just going to try and address that. I actually got it on full. I think I just need to speak a little bit louder. Sorry about that, Susie. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me just try and speak a little bit louder. So we're talking about um, the presence of arterial insufficiency. And if this is uh, present, we would uh, need to exclude, uh, investigate thoroughly, and uh, treat this appropriately before dealing uh, with the venous disease. Right? We, uh, we should not be uh, uh, trying to treat venous disease in the presence of uh, claudication. Uh, simple compression therapy, which is paramount in venous disease, can cause havoc if there's arterial insufficiency. Um, the duration of lower limb symptoms is important to document. Um, ask about the family history of varicose veins. 
ask the patient what activities cause pain or discomfort and what gives relief. Very commonly, patients will report that their pains, their legs get progressively painful, heavy, and edematous uh, as the day goes on at work. And they find by the end of the day, they have ankle swelling and they really have a lot of discomfort. And when they go home, they are relieved by sitting down and elevating their feet uh, relatively high up. Um, and this simply uh, improves the venous return and relieves their symptoms. Ask the patient if there are any specific uh, activities that they are unable to, to perform due to the leg symptoms. Um, for example, they may say that um, they cannot walk or stand all day. Um, they may reach the middle of the afternoon and they are no longer able to walk around their factory or um, their work premises. They have to now sit in their office and elevate their feet. Um, and this is indicative of um, varicose veins uh, affecting the day-to-day -day activities of the patient. Um, then we would ask them specifically if they had used um, compression stockings or compression bandages in the past and uh, we need to document whether they were compliant very often in our setting hot weather it is very difficult for patients to actually keep these uh, bandages and uh, compression stockings on and we've already spoken about uh, the elevation of the legs when resting okay now this uh, little slide this slide shows a little excerpt from um, the form that I use uh, when the patients come to the rooms, they are asked to fill this in and this gives me a clear indication um, of their symptomatology. Right? All these symptoms are related to venous disease and I ask them specifically if it's positive to specify whether it affects the right or left leg only or if they should tick both if it affects both legs. The things that I, I want them to comment on specifically are unsightly veins, pigmentation, dermatitis, which is indicative of eczema, aches or pains in the leg, heaviness or tired legs, itching of the skin of the legs, night cramps, blood clots, especially if they require blood thinners such as warfarin, superficial phlebitis, where they actually feel a palpable blood clot under the skin, pulmonary emboli, swelling in the legs or ankles, ulceration, either current or previous, as well as recent or remote leg trauma. Okay, now um, red writing, so please take a note of this. The uh, mnemonic, L-E-G-S, is very useful when questioning a patient, examining a patient's legs. We are looking for lipodermatosclerosis, eczema, gaps, which we uh, actually mean ulcers, and swelling or scars. Okay, so please take note of that mnemonic. Now, um, as far back as 2004, a very clear uh, physician-derived and physician-used system uh, came into play in the United States. This was called the Venus Clinical Severity Score. And the, there are 10 factors here with a maximum score of 3, which gives you a score out of 30. And this works in conjunction uh, with a CEAP system, which I'll show you on the next slide. But before we move on to that, I just wanted to go through these 10 items, which we've already touched on. Um, the pain, you would want the patient to give an indication of the severity. Uh, varicose veins themselves, how many, how extensive. Venous edema, skin pigmentation, inflammation of the skin in duration of the skin, the number of active ulcers, um, the duration of active ulceration, and the size of the active ulcers, um, as well as the use of compression therapy. Okay, so this can this uh, also comes in the form that I use to assess my patients. If anyone uh, wants a copy of this form, I can email it to you. 
I would be very happy indeed if you could uh, print these forms out and keep it in your practice and use it if you on a patient who you suspect has varicose veins. Um, it will actually make your assessment uh, that much easier. Okay, moving on to the CEAP system. These two should be used in conjunction. C stands for clinical assessment. E is the American spelling of etiology. A refers to anatomy and P to pathophysiology. Looking at the C1 to 6, if we look at the clinical photographs on the right of the screen, um, C1, uh, well C0 refers to no clinical signs at all. C1 is telangiectasia or reticular veins. C2 is varicose veins. C3 is edema and the corona, uh, which is a radiate um, uh, pattern on the skin. C4 refers to lipodermatous sclerosis and eczema. Note the wine glass narrowing, uh, sorry, the wine bottle, inverted wine bottle narrowing uh, as we approach the ankle. Uh, C5 refers to ulcer scar, which is a healed ulcer. And C7, C6 sorry, refers to active ulceration. The etiology could be congenital, primary, um, and secondary. The commonest cause that we actually come across is the EP which is the primary. Right? We, um, you'll remember from the previous lecture we're not actually aware of the etiology. We don't really know why this happens. A refers to anatomy, AS refers to superficial vein involvement, AD deep vein involvement and AP perforator veins. P stands for pathophysiology. There's only two that we're concerned with in veins. R, PR is reflux and PO is obstruction. Um, the CEAP plus VCSS system uh, used together has been extensively investigated and um, ratified. Um, it allows for um, very clear clinical assessment and um, a common language of venous disease to emerge. I've got a slide that we will actually go through. This is a before and after surgery picture of the same patient. And we will actually apply the scores. Um, the patient had daily pain, giving him a score of two multiple varicose veins, as you can see on the picture here. He had venous edema in the afternoon, so all of those gave him a score of two. He did not have any of these which are not highlighted in blue and then he was using compression most days and that also gave him a score of two. So if we add all those twos up we come to a VCSS score of eight and the CEAP uh, was a total of three. Now when um, we after treatment he underwent treatment and we are now able to immediately see that there is an improvement. The VCSS score has dropped to 4 because he no longer has pain. Varicose veins you can clinically, macroscopically see are reduced. The venous edema is now in the evenings only, not in the afternoons. And he still uses compression on both days. So this gives him a much better score of 4. Please note the little factoid in red. More than 60% of all leg ulcers are venous in etiology. Okay, a little bit of stress relief. We've gone through a lot of information and uh, we have an indication of uh, the likely uh, higher education um, options that may be available in the upcoming years in our country and uh, a little joke about the uh, a thank you note from the Guptas thanking the taxpayers for the 730 million rand of our money that they used to finance the wedding in uh, 2013. Okay, uh, remember facts in red, very important. The best treatment options in my opinion for varicose veins uh, the minimally invasive approach is the ablation of refluxing superficial trunks followed by foam sclerotherapy to spider veins and tortuous varicosities and then it's very important to closely follow up the patient. Ok, 
Okay, then moving on from the clinical assessment, we proceed to the laboratory investigations. Um, varicose veins per se do not require specific blood tests unless the history is suggestive of thrombophilia. Um, if, uh, however, the... Sorry, is anyone else having uh, difficulty with the sound? I, uh, I've actually got the sound on full sensitivity on my software, but I don't actually know why it's uh, it's not uh, picking up. Okay, I've just uh, reset it. I I hope that improves. Um, if anyone's having any difficulty with sound, please can you uh, let me know. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mudley. Dr. Mudley says that the sound quality is good on his side. I'm sorry uh, some people are having difficulty with the sound. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think it may be uh, with your speakers or connection on your side. I'm, I do apologize for that, but we are broadcasting at maximum volume. Okay, continuing with the laboratory investigations, um, there are blood tests required in preparation for ablation, even if you are uh, planning to do minimally invasive ablation, uh, you should exclude things like anemia. You don't want to be doing a procedure on a patient who's anemic for some other reason. Um, HIV status and CD4 still plays a role. Uh, however, nowadays this absolute cutoff of CD4 is falling away and what we are tending to look at is the overall clinical condition of the patient. If the patient is uh, relatively well nourished and they look generally well. It is possible to even proceed with um, open surgery, not specific to, excuse me, not specific to varicose veins. Um, even if the CD4 is, for example, less than 300. Okay, but uh, if you are concerned, it is uh, safer to check the HIV status and CD4 and possibly put the patient on to a nutritional program together with heart therapy and uh, repeat the uh, CD4 in six months. Uh, varicose vein surgery is by no means an emergency. Um, the patient can be optimized uh, before proceeding. Okay, um, then check bleeding time and clotting times if the history is suggestive of a patient with a bleeding tendency. Right. Uh, remember that you will be um, going into a vein and uh, these veins are under pressure because of the venous hypertension. So if you have a patient with a bleeding, bleeding tendency, you definitely want to pick that up and correct it preoperatively. Then, of course, if the patient has comor comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, any endocrine dysfunction, uh, that may require additional blood investigations, but that will be on a case-to-case uh, -case basis. Okay, then moving on to imaging tests for venous reflux disease. This falls into three categories. Um, duplex Doppler being the major component. Uh, the vast majority of imaging can actually be done using a standard duplex Doppler machine, which has a um, linear probe specifically at a high frequency of 7 to 10 megahertz um, so that allows you uh, to look at the very superficial structures uh, however it is usually um, all right to uh, visualize the deep deep veins to exclude a DBT as well using the same linear probe um, the CT venogram is uh, the next investigation of choice and this typically um, would be in the event of obstruction if you have a patient who has large dilated veins on the anterior abdominal wall you may want to um, you may want to do a CT venogram to exclude uh, proximal obstruction and then MR uh, venogram uh, can be used in a patient who has, for example, renal dysfunction, uh, where a CT with contrast cannot be used because of the risk of renal damage. 
uh, that's not to say that MR um, magnetic resonance contrasts are not nephrotoxic some of them are so you must uh, be very careful with that um, however um, the CT venogram and MR venogram would be ordered uh, by a vein specialist um, duplex Doppler is really the best investigation um, there are lots of doctors that have um, probes in their rooms they have ultrasound machines um, and I would encourage you to actually get a, a linear probe um, for your machine um, a lot of specialists for example urologists use the same probe uh, for assessment of uh, testicular problems and uh, superficial structures. So um, if urologists are interested in learning how to do a little bit of duplex Doppler, they can check with their urologist, uh, sorry, uh, radiologist in their hospital or ultrasonographers, or please give me a call. I'll be only too happy to show you the settings on the machine. It's really not difficult. And uh, you could be picking up um, patients that could benefit from uh, treatment of their varicose veins. Okay, duplex Doppler is not a quick investigation. Um, I know I used to get very upset in public service. I'd send a patient for a um, duplex Doppler and I'd specify that I wanted assessment of the saphenofemoral junction, the saphenopopliteal junction, and assessment of perforators and I would get a report back with one line saying no DVT noted. So this is a big problem um, because there's a lot of expertise required to do a duplex, uh, venous duplex ultrasound examination um, and unfortunately the vast majority of um, ultrasonographers uh, have only been taught to exclude DVT. Um, you may have to consult your radiologist and the radiologist will definitely be able to help you and do the full investigation uh, and they would obviously ensure that their ultrasonographers are adequately trained. Um, I haven't uh, had this type of problem in the private sector. Um, we always get exactly what we request. Um, however, in the public sector, it is necessary to refer a patient all the way down to the vascular clinic at um, Albert Lituli to get a venous uh, duplex ultrasound done. It's not done at Nguelazana. Um, we did have an ultrasound technician at one point that was able to do it, but I think they left and went into private practice. And just uh, to emphasize that the Doppler or the venous duplex should be done in the erect position. This is just a stock photograph showing the uh, probe being placed on the popliteal vein. Um, it's actually not ideal. Um, even when I do ultrasound in my room, I actually have the patient sit on the bedside and put their feet on the, uh, on the steps so that they are semi-erect. And on occasion, I actually ask them to stand up erect. Um, and it, you get a lot more information in this position. Um, the manual or mechanical compression of the veins is very easily visible and you actually have to be careful that you don't apply too much of pressure and completely occlude the veins you've got to be very gentle and the thing that we are looking for is the duration of reflux um, but we'll come to that uh, just now there are some specific parameters and we're looking for veins uh, varicosities or enlarged um, truncal varicosities more than six millimeters Right. Once we get to more than six millimeters, these are really big and these will benefit um, from ablation. Specifically, if you are looking under an ulcer, uh, now bear in mind that you cannot always apply the probe on an ulcer. Uh, it's painful and also you are possibly contaminating the ulcer. It is possible to sometimes place the probe on the uh, almost normal skin just adjacent to the ulcer and direct the ultrasound towards the base of the ulcer and pick up um, large veins and this cutoff that you're looking off for here is greater than 3.5 millimeters. Now um, there are morphological criteria for obstruction. Uh, we are looking for augmentation. We are looking for uh, 
blockage of the vein um, and then we are looking for patterns of reflux and obstruction. Now as I mentioned the proper venous duplex ultrasound is not a quick examination it can take you between 30 minutes to an hour and this is the type of marking if you ask the ultrasonographer to mark out the varicosities they would actually uh, give you um, the patient send the patient back to you with markings like this this is um, done if you are possibly taking the patient to theater and you want all the veins marked out preoperatively okay and obviously you can see the extent of the veins in this patient's leg um, so this is not a quick investigation okay Right, just some parameters. Um, the reflux uh, time is the duration of the reflux. Now that isn't as important as the peak reflux velocity or what could also be called the rate of reflux. Right, so it's this arrow here on the um, Doppler signal that you can get on the same linear probe that we look at more specific than the reflux time and then also you look at the size this large the area under the line um, which is um, significant in terms of assessing the severity of the reflux right please note with respect to venous duplex scanning the duplex ultrasound scanning is the primary venous testing tool um, this detects segmental reflux and obstruction accurately. Um, venous duplex scanning should routinely be extended above the inguinal ligament to assess for those large veins uh, possibly on the anterior abdominal wall due to obstruction and um, it allows a qualitative method of focal segments. Um, please note reflex time does not indicate the degree of severity it's the rate of reflux or the peak reflux uh, PRV, the peak reflux velocity or rate of reflux as I just mentioned on the previous slide uh, which assesses the severity of reflux. Uh, please bear in mind the severity of reflux as well does not necessarily suggest that the patient requires intervention. Right? It's a combination of diagnosing reflux together with the symptomatology. Right, so if you have a high VCSS score, significant uh, C uh, rating on the CEAP score, uh, yet your reflux doesn't appear that severe, you can still proceed with intervention. However, if you have significantly positive parameters on um, duplex ultrasound, yet the patient hardly has symptoms, um, it may be better to just monitor that patient and see uh, before uh, see the symptoms developing before offering treatment. Okay, and then multi-segment scores really are related to the clinical severity, so you can actually score multiple segments. Okay, moving on to CT venography. This is a uh, 3D reconstruction. Uh, just to make it easier to appreciate. I think it's fairly obvious that the IVC is intact. This is the left common iliac vein, external iliac. The um, internal iliac is not that prominent, but the problem is very evident on the right side. The entire right common iliac, external iliac and internal iliac vein is obstructed. It is probably completely thrombosed and this is usually where the CT scan um, comes uh, into being useful. Right, MR venography, okay this actually shows an interesting abnormality. Um, what we have here is there is uh, pathology here but what we have is the compression of the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery. Right, so that crosses over here and it actually causes compression, although in this patient this is not the cause of the pathology. 
right? This uh, finding is called the May Turner syndrome, and it is uh, quite common in female patients, um, and uh, it may, on occasion, require stenting. Okay, so the importance of the MR uh, venography and the CT venography is to pick up obstruction, uh, which is evident on the left common iliac on the, the picture here, and on this side, the right common iliac and the uh, distal veins are grossly abnormal. Okay, um, in the event that you do detect these abnormalities, it is essential to uh, correct these before addressing varicosities. Right? You don't want to go ablating these veins and then find that an obstruction had been completely missed because that would result in a very poor outcome. You're not helping your patient and you're actually complicating their venous hypertension and venous reflux disease. Okay, so if the uh, suspicion is of obstruction, venous obstruction, um, the venous Doppler, venous ultrasound, duplex ultrasound on its own can give you a lot of information. Uh, but if there are areas that you are not unable to visualize, then you could do a um, CT or MR venography. Okay, so in summary, we have... Um, looked at the relevant history. I've mentioned that I've got um, forms that I'm happy to distribute uh, to anyone who wants them. Um, you could keep copies and use this to assess varicose vein patients in your rooms. You ask them to fill out the history and then you go over it with them. Um, there's also a clinical assessment. I've got the VCSS and CEAP all on my uh, initial assessment forms. Please bear in mind the mnemonic LEGS, which stands for lipodermatosclerosis, eczema, gaps, which means ulcers, and scarring or swelling. Right, we spoke about laboratory tests, which are um, not really necessary unless there are um, some workup required prior to surgery or if there are comorbidities or if the patient has either a bleeding tendency or a thrombophilic tendency, which needs to be investigated before you would offer them any type of venous intervention. Uh, the imaging we've touched on briefly. Uh, we've noted that duplex ultrasound of the vein is paramount. That is by far the most important investigation. Um, and if you are suspecting obstruction or some kind of abnormality like a May Turner syndrome, then you would want a CT venogram or an MR angiogram, eh, sorry, an MR venogram. Um, I haven't gone into too much of clinical examination. Um, the old methods of applying some kind of a tourniquet and a, in the uh, reclining patient, in the supine patient, and then getting them to stand up, uh, most of that has fallen away now. Uh, we really just do the VCSS plus CEAP, which can be done really by applying the typical um, uh, assessment, which is um, inspection, uh, palpation, uh, percussion, and auscultation. Um, the auscultation, rather than being done with a stethoscope, is actually done with a uh, venous duplex examination, if you want to put it that way, um, and uh, just palpating, inspecting, um, I actually take photographs of my patients, and uh, you could consider doing that as well. Okay, it uh, brings us to the end of the lecture. If there are any questions, uh, please post them to WhatsApp. I will try and answer them um, through the um, broadcast. I think this is a throwback to your junior years in a public hospital when your patient is being discussed during the morbidity and mortality meeting, everyone looking at you like. <laughs> okay, um, there's a short video clip that I would uh, like to share with you. It uh, really just uh, covers the um, radio frequency ablation. And um, 
what this is actually is a um, endoscopic view. So what they've done, um, you may be aware that one of the uh, more recent operative treatments um, was endoscopic subfascial ligation of perforators. Okay, this is still being done in some centers, but uh, using the minimally, minimally invasive uh, techniques is no longer necessary. Um, however, in this particular video, they have inserted a, a laparoscope into the subfascial plane, and they are actually uh, viewing, uh, actually it's the prefascial plane, they are viewing, they've got a direct view, they've insufflated some air, and they've got a direct view of the great saphenous vein, and we are actually looking at radio frequency energy being applied to the vein. Okay, so that's the vein in the center. You can actually see it uh, absorbing the radio frequency energy. There's some necrosis occurring, and it's, it's a very quick clip. I'll play it again. And um, the vein is actually being ablated. So once this has been done, uh, you pull the catheter back and keep on uh, ablating along the length of the vein. And this is a safe procedure. Um, and I think it's fairly obvious that there isn't going to be any blood flow in that, that vein after you've done this. All right, so the interesting thing about this, this can be done as a minimally invasive technique. No large incision, just a tiny um, almost the equivalent of a drip insertion into the um, distal vein and um, the insertion of a we will go into this in the next lecture uh, but it is a minimally invasive procedure okay thank you very much uh, we finished a little early any questions Okay, there's no questions on WhatsApp. Um, thank you very much, everyone. The MCQ. Um, so if you are just uh, keen to watch this video and you're not concerned about the uh, points, uh, then uh, there's nothing more that you need to do. Um, I'm going to post this link all right, um, this is the link. I hope it's visible. I'm going to post this to WhatsApp. Please click on this link and answer the questions. And um, I will uh, then mark it. And uh, you need a score of 70% plus, after which you will get your certificate. Okay, I'm just going to post this link. Should be coming through now. If anyone uh, is unable to get the link, please uh, please let me know. I will send it to you directly. Now, just to show you that uh, what we're going to find here, I'm obviously not allowed to give you the answers. Okay, this is the CME. Okay, you're going to come to the screen. You hit uh, begin quiz. Right, and you're going to be taken through five questions. Select one correct answer. Um, and you need to get about four out of five correct. So you're only allowed to get one wrong. Um, please uh, do that um, now or at your convenience. Um, I will also post the link to this live stream onto YouTube so you can watch this. Um, uh, it won't be live, obviously, but you can watch it on your own time. And um, you can also then access the MCQ, answer it, and uh, get your...
certificate, CPD certificate, you uh, are allocated two CPD points for this activity. Okay, thank you very much everyone. I'm going to be signing out now. There don't seem to be any more questions. No questions. Thank you for your attention. And we will try to do this on a regular basis about once a month. And um, I hope that we can get uh, more people involved. Thank you very much and good night. Have a good evening.